So in previous videos, we've looked at how strong and weak acids react in water. And now what we're going to do is we're going to investigate how does that relate to the pH of those strong or weak acids in an aqueous solution, reminding us that we have water as our solvent. So by the end of this, hopefully we're able to calculate the pH of a strong acid and a weak acid, and also think about how do we compare these two acids and the two types of acids when they dissolve in water. In addition to that, we hopefully want to be able to relate pH, pOH, hydronium, and hydroxide concentrations for these aqueous solutions. Now, as our kind of guiding thought, whenever we're calculating the pH of a solution, it's very helpful to think about, let's, let's kind of narrow it down to what are we trying to identify? We are trying to identify the hydronium concentration or the hydroxide concentration, depending on which of those two is produced in the specific reaction that we're looking at. And that is based upon the specific compound type that's dissolved in water. So reminding us that when we're looking at hydronium, that would be from any kind of acid. So that would be either a strong acid or a weak acid producing hydronium in water. And then we would have our bases, whether a strong base or weak base producing hydroxide in water. And so we're going to look at these with a couple examples, and we're going to calculate the hydronium hydroxide and pH of uh, our solutions that we would see when we're looking at a weak acid uh, versus a strong acid. And so here, let's first start by saying, well, what is the pH of an hydroxide and hydronium concentration of a 0.5 molarity HCl solution? Now, again, we put this under the strong acid category, but we also want to think, how do I know that this is a strong acid? Like, what is an indicator to me that lets me know that this is a strong acid? Well, if maybe at some point in time we've maybe memorized or identified that there's an, a certain number of strong acids, HCl, hydrochloric acid, is one of those. We could also go to the fact that we could look at a Ka table, and what we would notice that there is no Ka or equilibrium constant acid, uh, acid reaction for HCl. Now, what does that mean to us? That means that it does not undergo an equilibrium reaction. We don't actually see it undergo an equilibrium reaction. It actually undergoes a one-way reaction. So when we write out our HCl reacting with water, we're going to draw this one-way arrow to represent that it is a full or 100% reaction. And that's going to give us hydronium and our chloride ions that we would have here. And again, that's because our hydrogen is being transferred from HCl to H2O to give us hydronium and hydroxide. Now, because we have this 100% reaction, what that means is that the concentration of our HCl that we add into the solution is going to be equal to the concentration of our hydronium ion after this reaction is done, right? We get a 100% reaction. And so this becomes very straightforward in saying, well, if I know we have a 0.5 molarity HCl solution, what that tells me is that the concentration of uh, our hydronium ion in this solution is going to be equal to that same value, 0 0.5 molarity. And so now we know the hydronium concentration. And again, we can only make this assumption because we are dealing with a strong acid where it fully reacts. Now, once we know the hydronium concentration, we know that that is linked to pH, it's linked to our hydroxide concentration, and it's linked to pOH. All three of those are interlinked. linked. So if I know one of them, I can calculate the other three. Uh, in this case, we're going to calculate our hydroxide concentration as well. And we remind ourselves that we have this relationship that the products of our hydronium and hydroxide concentration is our Kw value. So if I go ahead and do a little bit of a rearrangement here, we're going to get our hydroxide concentration is equal to Kw divided by our hydronium concentration, right? We just divided that over there. And so now, since I know our hydronium concentration, we can go ahead and plug in the values we have here. Kw is the water autoionization constant divided by our concentration here, 0.5 molarity. And we would get a concentration of 2.0 times 10 to the negative 14th molarity for our hydroxide concentration. And again, this is a very strong acid. It makes sense that this is a very low concentration 
because we have a very high concentration of our strong acid. And again, reminding us the higher the concentration of hydroxide, the lower the concentration of hydronium and vice versa. In this case, the high concentration of hydronium contributes to a very low concentration in our hydroxide ion. So now we have our hydroxide ion concentration. Then let's go ahead and see how do we connect this to our pH. Remember pH is the negative log of our hydronium concentration. So if we know our hydronium concentration, 0 0.50, we will get a pH of 0 0.30. And again, this is a very low pH. This makes sense because we have a fairly concentrated 0.5 molarity HCl strong acid solution. And so now when we see a couple of important things to realize when we're looking at our strong acids, we get a 100% reaction, which leads to the fact that the concentration of hydronium is equal to the concentration of that acid. And then once we know that, we have the ability to relate hydronium and hydroxide using our KW relationship. And then we also have the ability to calculate our pH now that we know our hydronium concentration. So that's looking at a strong acid. Now let's maybe look at the difference between that and a weak acid. So we're going to look at uh, hypochlorous acid, HClO. And here, again, reminding us when we're comparing a strong or weak acid, a weak acid undergoes partial ionization in water, meaning it partially reacts. It does not fully react. If I start with 0.5 molarity HClO, that does not mean I necessarily get 0.5 molarity H3O plus because it is a weak acid. So now let's think through, well, what does this look? How does this look different? But how does this look similar to a strong acid reaction? So again, we have our HClO. And before we even start anything thinking about hydronium hydroxide or pH, we always want to look at what is the reaction that occurs when this substance dissolves in water. So we have our HClO, it's gonna react with water. And because it only partially reacts, we're gonna treat it with this equilibrium arrow, right? And again, this is because we have a partial reaction. Not 100% of this is gonna react with water, only a small percent of it's gonna react, and that is dependent on our Ka value. We'll look at that in one second. So again, this is going to transfer this H plus to water to give us H3O plus and the ClO minus ion. Now to the extent that this reaction occurs corresponds to the Ka for HClO. So we're gonna look at our reactant here, HClO. We're gonna to go to a Ka table and we go to a Ka table and we find the Ka for HClO specific to that substance is 2.9 times 10 to the negative eighth. So now we know our equilibrium constant here. And again, if we're trying to find either hydronium or hydroxide or pH, we need to find the equilibrium concentration of either hydroxide or hydronium. We notice we're making hydronium in this reaction. We want to think about our equilibrium. Let's go ahead and set up a rice table. So reaction, initial change, equilibrium. We're going to ignore water here. Let's create a separation between our reactants and products. We start with 0.5 molarity HClO. We did not directly add in any H3O plus or ClO minus. And again, reminding us that is an approximation because we do have some contributed there from water right before we actually add this in there. But it's very small relative to what we're going to see we're going to get from this reaction. Because of that, we're going to produce some amount of our products. And we're going to decrease by some amount of our reactants. And again, now we have our equilibrium concentrations. And so we're going to take those and we're going to go ahead and plug it into our Ka expression. So now if we're going to calculate this uh, and find the equilibrium concentration, we plug it into our Ka. So let's explicitly write out what we mean by our Ka here. Our product concentrations divided by our reactant concentrations, again, all at equilibrium. And we know the ratio of those products to reactants based upon our equilibrium constant Ka. And so if we look at this, we'd have 2.9 times 10 to the negative eighth equals, let's plug in what we said for our expressions there, point our x and x divided by 0 0.50 minus x. Now all we have to do here is solve for x. We have this unknown. 
Now, again, as we're looking at this, let's answer the question, can we save a little bit of time by not actually going through a process that requires us to solve the, algebra, uh, the quadratic equation? And the way that we could do that is we can say, can we say that that minus x is negligible? And effectively, this is 0 0.50, not 0 0.5 minus x. And the way that we look at that is we see here that our Ka is very small relative to our original concentration. Again, we're looking for 10 to the third times smaller. And again, this would be point. 0.5 would be 5 times 10 to the negative 1. So there's, no, there's seven orders of magnitudes of there, negative 1 to negative 8. When we're comparing these. And we see it's very small. Now what that means is we're only going to produce a very small amount of our products relative to the original amount of our reactants that we have. So therefore, let's go ahead and make this approximation. And let's see if it makes sense. Does it make sense to say this is pretty close to 0.5? So as we do that, this simplifies now to 2.9 times 10 to the negative eighth equals x squared divided by 0 0.50. And now we just do a little bit of quick algebra and we solve for x and we get x equals 1.2 times 10 to the negative fourth molarity. Okay, now, well, now that we found that concentration, we need to think back to what does that correspond to? Well, that corresponds to the concentration of H3O plus. It also corresponds to the concentration of ClO minus. It also contributes to a decrease in the amount of our HClO. And we go back in here and we see, well, this 0.5 minus, this would be 0.00012. So it makes sense for us to have made this approximation. And so it's an okay approximation here that we'd see that doesn't really change that number. So mathematically, it makes sense for us to do that approximation. So now we see importantly here as it relates to our pH and hydronium and hydroxide concentrations, we now know the concentration of hydronium. We also know the concentration of the ClO minus ions, but in this case, that's not going to contribute to the pH, so we're not necessarily focusing on that. And so now we know the concentration of our hydronium ion is 1.2 times 10 to the negative fourth molarity. Well, now since we know that, we have the ability to calculate uh, those other two variables that we're looking at here, which would be our hydroxide concentration. And again, we, re we wrote this out from our KW expression. And so now we could say this is 1 times 10 to the negative 14th divided by 1.2 times 10 to the negative 4th. And again, we just did this in the previous one with our strong acid. This is just rearranging that KW expression. And we would get a hydroxide concentration of 8.3 times 10 to the negative 11th molarity. And again, higher concentration of, of hydronium, lower concentration of hydroxide. And that makes sense because this is an acid. It should give us more hydronium than hydroxide. Now, finally, we want to calculate our pH. And we know this, again, since we know our Hydronium concentration, we would just take the negative log of that, 1.2 times 10 to the negative fourth, and we would get a pH of 3.92. Now I wanna take a quick side note here in looking at how do we calculate significant figures when we are calculating pH. Now let me just mention, I'm not gonna get into the whole log calculations, but this power of 10 variable gets placed into our integer value, and then these two numbers here get placed into how many digits we actually have past the decimal place. So when we're thinking about significant digits here, what we'll see is that the total number of significant digits or significant figures for our concentration of H3O plus, in this specific example, there's two of them, right? We got one, two. That is going to be equal to the number of significant digits past the decimal place in our pH measurement. So in this case, again, two digits past the decimal place. And vice versa, if we're going backwards, if we knew the pH and we're going backwards to the hydronium concentration, we would use the number of digits past the decimal place. That would be our total number of digits that we would have and our hydronium concentration. 
So I just wanted to take a side note there and thinking about like, why, why do I record this as three total significant digits, even though I only had two here? And that has everything to do with the math of logs. And again, we want to get into that uh, at a later point in time. Um, we can get into that, but this is not a math class. This is just, uh, I wanted to make sure we are aware of that. So now hopefully we have some confidence in calculating our concentrations of hydronium, hydroxide, and also our pH, either with a weak acid, right, where we're looking at our equilibrium, or with a strong acid, where we're looking at this 100% reaction.